Well, good afternoon. It's so good to be with each one of you. I appreciate so much the, the visitors that are here with us. You've come, you've encouraged us this afternoon, and I hope that I can be an encouragement to each of you that are here this evening. Uh, I appreciate so much those of you who have taken the time out of your afternoon to come be a part of spiritual things. That shows how much you, you love the Lord, how much you love His people, how much you love His Word that we've just sang about. And that's also very encouraging to me. You know, preachers at times feed off of people. We feed off the energy that people put forth. That's, that's, just, that's just part of what we do. And you have definitely encouraged me so far as we've worshipped and sung together. And I thank you for that so much. And, and I'm just thankful that I'm able to be here. Thanks again to the elders for giving me this opportunity to come and preach lessons from the Word of God to you. Uh, something I forgot to mention this morning... Uh, it's, it's really good to be with John Michael and, and his family. John Michael and I kind of go way back, in our, uh, in, at least in my, uh, in my preaching days. John Michael and I used to share a pulpit uh, throughout the month out to the little country, local church. And uh, those were good days. I got to know him uh, very well. And he just really encouraged me through that time. And I hope I was an encouragement to him. But we've stayed in touch over the years. A little bit, but it's just really good to be able to see him and his family here today, and to be with all of you, but uh, I really do appreciate John Michael and his encouragement over the years. We've been studying in these last few lessons about diligent discipleship. We've noticed that from the studies that we've already had, that diligence in regard to our service to the Lord is a very important thing. And when we talk about that word diligence, what we're talking about is earnestness and eagerness. We need to have that associated with our service to the Lord. We need to have a, an eagerness about what we're doing as Christians. That we need to be determined to do those things that the Lord's giving us to do in a manner that causes us to always be stirred up and zealous about it. And to be eager to keep His commandments. We've talked about some aspects already that make us diligent disciples. The first of those things is that disciples must have the proper attitude. Our attitude is very important. In our service to the Lord, we have to have the proper attitude toward God, the proper attitude toward ourselves, the proper attitude toward our brethren, and also the proper attitude toward those who oppose us. If we're going to have the attitude that we need to make us diligent disciples. We notice secondly today that our attitude as a disciple determines our outlook as a disciple. And we look back at 2 Peter chapter 1 and we talked about that Peter shows us what that proper outlook is. You're one who understands what your motivation is in your service to the Lord. I have grace and peace multiplied to me because of my like precious faith that I share with the apostles. And because of that, I have access to the apostles' knowledge. And having access to the apostles' knowledge, I now have access to these great and precious promises that I have revealed to me through God in His Word. But that also brings me to my responsibility. I have a responsibility to uphold my end of the bargain. I have to access God's grace by faith, right? And I'm meant to be obedient to the things that have been revealed to me by way of the Holy Spirit. Those things that the apostles teach me throughout the New Testament are those things that I need to be responsible to keeping in my service to the Lord. And our faith needs to be added to and caused to abound and grow. And when we do that, we can know that we're going to have the focus that we need. Our emphasis is going to be in the right place. It's going to be on those things above. And therefore, I'm going to be one who's always bearing the good fruit of the gospel. I'm not going to be someone who's forgotten that was cleansed from his old sins. And I can finally have the assurance of the fact that I know that I'm a child of God. I can have the assurance of the fact that there's a home for me waiting there in heaven above, Jesus sitting there at the right hand of God as my mediator right now. I'll be able to be with Him, be like Him all through eternal glory. That's quite an outlook, isn't it? But with that attitude and that outlook, disciples also need to understand that we need to be doers of the Word. That proper attitude and that proper outlook on our life cause us to open up this revelation that God has given us and be those that practice this to the saving of our soul. If you will, open your Bibles with me to James chapter 1. Disciples must be doers of the Word if they're going to be diligent disciples. 
We find all about this in the first chapter of James' letter. And as James is is writing this letter and he's talking about what the Christian's focus ought to be when going through trials, that he can know that these trials that he's experiencing, well, these things are only here because they're making your faith better, making you stronger. Now, at the same time, don't blame God because you're having difficulty. God doesn't bring these hard times upon you. He only allows them so that your faith can grow and be stronger. And there are certain qualities that you need. As you're facing these trials, there's a certain wisdom that you need. But that wisdom has to be put into practice. Pick up with me verse 19 of James chapter 1. James writes, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I want you to think, just think about the song that we just sing. Give me the Bible. Give me the Word of God. Well, why do we need it? Well, James says that we need it to be able to transform ourselves into the people that we need to be before God. We can be those people who are certainly blessed by God if we're a people who are allowing His Word to mold us and shape us into what God wants us to be. Then we'll have everything we need to accomplish our spiritual task here upon this earth. And I think that every person in this building, I'm I'm quite sure, most of us at least, would say that the Word of God is important. We'd say, oh yes, it's a, it, it's a very important thing. We need the Bible, but how much of our lives are spent totally dedicating ourselves to a study of it day in and day out? How many of us are putting our focus and our emphasis on this primarily above everything else in our lives? You know, sometimes the words that we speak are very influential to the negative standpoint when others observe our lives for what they really are as seen with their eyes. However, James tells us, if we'll take the things that we read, apply those things to our lives, then we just won't be these people who hear the Word of God, let it go in one ear and write out the other. We'll be a people who take what we hear Apply it to our lives and allow that which dwells within us then to mold and shape us, transform us, as we talked about this morning, into that creature that God desires for us to be. A diligent disciple. You know, as James is talking about this, he really focuses on two different individuals, doesn't he? He talks about the forgetful hearer and the doer of the word. But as he's talking about these two individuals, what we have to notice that's going on in the background is, is James is speaking a lot about the Word of God. And that shouldn't just be seen in just a passing type of way. Because there's a lot of important things that need to be observed from what James says about God's Word. And we're going to begin there by looking, first of all, at what James says about the Word of God. First of all, what we see that he says is that it it is a law. Look in James chapter 1 again in verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. What is God's word? What is the New Testament? Is it a law? It's a law. There's so many people today that they want to argue that, you know what, there used to be a law in place, but we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. Well, If that's so, then James was wrong. And James isn't wrong, is he? We are under a system of grace today. But we access that grace through obedience to the perfect law of liberty. 
It's that law of liberty that gives us access to the forgiving power of Jesus' blood. So yes, it's a law. We have to think about that with common sense wisdom. If there's no law, there can be no sin, right? And John says in 1 John 3 and verse 4, the CSB translates it this way, and I put that up there just because it makes it so clear and so plain, doesn't it? Everyone who commits sin also breaks the law. Sin is the breaking of the law. You go against the word of God, you've sinned because you've broken God's law. Just think about it. If I leave here this afternoon, and I hope this doesn't happen, but let's just say I get pulled over and I'm speeding and I really, I really don't drive that fast. My wife gets on to me all the time. She says I drive too slow. But you know, if you've had several speeding tickets in the past, you learn to drive a lot slower. But let's just say I get pulled over and I'm not paying attention and I'm speeding and a police officer comes up to the window and he says, sir, you're driving too fast. You're driving 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. I'm going to have to write you a ticket. Well, if there was no law in place against speeding, would it be wrong for me to speed? No, there would be no problem with it, would it? Because there's no law against it and there can be no issue with driving too fast everybody understands that that's just simple isn't it well it's the same way when it comes to sin in the word of God if there were no law in place there'd be no sin none of us would have any problem would we and if there were no law then guess what none of us would need Jesus would we but you know sometimes I have religious people argue with me that there's not a law today and my, my question is to them then why in the world do you need Jesus But in reality, we all need Jesus. Why? Because we're all lawbreakers. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Another very obvious thing to realize is, is if there's no law today, then we cannot fulfill the will of God. What is the will of God for us? Well, did not Paul write to the Galatians and say, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill what? The law of Christ. Well, if there's no law for the Christian today, then there's no way for me to fulfill the will of God because I have to fulfill the will of Christ. And the, the will of Christ is made known to me in the law that's come by way of the Holy Spirit. So the Word of God, it is most certainly a law. It's a law, no doubt, but... It also shows us beyond the shadow of a doubt the need for it. There's a necessity for there being a law today because it gives us something to follow. It's a standard that's been set for us. If that standard's not there, we don't know who we are, who we need to be and where we're going. And furthermore, it lets us know that we have sinned and transgressed that law and there's a need for us to access the forgiving power of Jesus' blood. So you see the necessity of the word of God being a law. But further in verse 25, James points out to us that it's not just a law. It's a perfect law. That's in contrast to some things from the past, isn't it? You know, God had another law in place, yes. The law of Moses was there. And in contrast to the law of Moses, the law of Christ is perfect. What was wrong with the law of Moses? Turn back with me. To Hebrews chapter 7. Drop your marker here at James chapter 1, please. And let's make our way back to Hebrews chapter 7. The old law, the law of Moses, it was insufficient. The law of Moses could not save man. Now, was the problem with the law? No, it wasn't. Nothing that comes from God is insufficient in itself. The problem with the law was, was, was us. We couldn't keep it. The purpose of the old law wasn't set to save man. It was sent to show man that you can't keep this. You need something else. I like to say sometimes when, when God gave the Israelites the law of Moses, He said, here's the law of Moses. Here's what it's like to be me. You keep that. And no one could do it. No one did it except Jesus. 
Jesus came and kept that law perfectly and fulfilled it so that he could make atonement for our sins, but nobody else could do it. And the Hebrew writer points that out to us in chapter 7, here beginning in verse 18. Speaking of Jesus being our high priest, it says in verse 18, speaking of what Jesus has brought in, this, this new and living way, it says, For on the one hand there is the annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. How is it that we draw near to God? Well, it wasn't through that which was here initially. It wasn't through the old law of Moses. It's through the new and the living way. It's through the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. Now, let's say again, it's, it's not a system of perfection. The law of Moses was a system of perfection. You had to keep the law perfectly to be saved by that law. But we recognize today what they didn't have then is what we have now, which is grace. And there again, we can make up for what we lack in this system because we have Jesus there mediating for us at the right hand of God. We have a perfect law of liberty. Through my obedience to the gospel, it gives me access to the saving power of Jesus. And I can find forgiveness at the right hand of God. That's in contrast to what we had before. The law of Moses couldn't redeem man. Look at chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Speaking of Moses' law, he says in verse 1, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For when they... Had for then when they not have ceased to be offered, for the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. The Levitical sacrifices he's pointing out here in their ceaseless repetition would never make the worshiper perfect. All it would do is remind them of their sinfulness. And the, at least the, the mindful Jew would have to recognize the fact that we keep doing this year after year after year. There has to be something better. This law can't redeem us. There has to be something that comes that's better and stronger. And there was. The rest of those verses there, verses 5 through 10, takes about, about Jesus coming and taking away the first and establishing the second. Jesus took away that old insufficient law that we could not keep and he put in place one that where he is making up for what we lack. And still we have the, the necessity of our obedience to the gospel, but there at the same time we have Jesus there making possible our reconciliation to God, which was not possible beforehand. And that's why Paul said what he said in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in Him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. But what brings us to that point? What teaches us that we have that in Christ Jesus? Is it not a law? Is it not a perfect law of liberty? It most certainly is. But James goes on to say a little bit more about it in verse 21. Back in James chapter 1, notice he not only says that it's a law, a perfect law of liberty, but he also says in verse 21 that we must receive it with meekness. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. The word of God must be embedded in the heart. If you went over to 1 Peter chapter 1, You'd find Peter saying that very thing. To, to we, we haven't been saved by some corruptible seed, but an incorruptible seed. Well, where is that seed found? That seed's found in the heart of the individual disciple. And it lives there, and it grows there. Well, what did Jesus say about the seed? Well, in Luke's account of the parable of the sober, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, he said the seed is the word of God. And when you have the seed living in your heart, then you have something there that's able to accomplish and bring about your eternal salvation. How important is the Word of God? 
It's absolutely important. It's so important that you have to receive it into yourself. It's just not something that you carry around and throw in the back seat of your car and get it out on Sunday and Wednesday and think it's going to do something for you. Listen, brethren, it's not something that you can leave on your coffee table at home and think by some way of osmosis it's going to change your life. No, this is something that you have to put into practice. He said it has to be received or implanted with meekness. Meekness is a strong word, isn't it? A lot of people think that meekness is weakness. Well, that's a mistake. Meekness is not weakness. I think meekness is best defined as strength under control. That's what meekness is. I think the best way to illustrate that is from a, from a guy who used to uh, fool with horses a whole lot. I used to put a bridle on a horse's head and put a bit in his mouth. And though he was many times bigger than me, I can control that huge animal. Why? Because I've got strength under control. I've got a bit in his mouth and a bridle on his head. And now I've got strength under control. Now, the, the animal underneath me had all the power and the energy in the world to bust out and do whatever it wanted to, right? But it had subjected itself to that which had it under control. Is that making sense to us there? It's the same way with you and I. God's law teaches us, the perfect law of liberty teaches us how we are to live and who we are to be. And what we are to do is to subject ourselves to that teaching. We have every bit of ability and energy just to burst out and live any way we want to, don't we? But I submit myself to the teaching. I let it bring me under control with meekness. I put away those things that would separate me from God and I make room for the Word of God to be implanted in me. Then it begins to change me from the inside out. It's what Paul said in Colossians 3 and verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. You've got to put off some things. I say it this way, you've got to put out some things before you can put some things in. Let's just be really, really simple. If you called me over to help you move furniture from your house, you needed my truck to help you load and move furniture, and if I showed up with a pile of rocks in the bed of my truck, how much help am I going to be to you? Zero. What am I first going to have to do? I'm going to have to unload something before I can put something else in, right? Before it can be any help at all. In the same way, we've got to unload some things out of our lives. We've got to empty some things out of our hearts so that we can put the Word of God in there where it belongs. And when we do, notice what James says it will do for us. James says it is able to save your soul. That's what it accomplishes for us. That's the power of transformation. It's in the gospel. Paul wrote himself in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to all who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. What is the gospel? It's the power of God to salvation. You can't be saved without it. Friends, you can't go to heaven without the gospel. You separate yourself from the word of God, you'll be lost forever. But with it, I'm not just talking about you carrying it around in your hand or having some app on your phone that you may refer to every once in a while. I'm talking about we take that Word of God, we live our lives by it, we saturate ourselves in it, we allow it to mold us and to shape us, to dictate our thoughts, our actions, everything that we do, every step that we take, every decision that we make. And when we do that, we are told that it will save our soul because it will transform us in exactly who God wants us to be. It gives us a spiritual rebirth. That's exactly what it does. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, he said, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. That term, begotten, it means born again. 
Paul had fathered them, if you will, through the gospel. And when I think about that, I, my mind goes back to when I was in high school. And when you get to be around, I, I think it was around it's probably the 12th grade. Uh, maybe it was back when you were a junior in high school. The Army recruiter started calling. And they wanted, to, they wanted you to enlist in the Army, the Marines, the Air Force or something. And they, they wanted to take you out to eat. They say, we'll take you out and we'll buy you a big steak. Well, I never took them up on the deal because that's just not what I wanted to do. But some of my friends did. They took them up on the bargain and they took them out and they sat them down at a fine restaurant and, you know, bought them a big steak and they ate. And the whole time they're trying to convince them that they need to join up. And many of those guys came back ready to save the world. I'm going to tell you, they were taught well. What happened? Well, they had fathered them into a new way of thinking. A lot of those guys went to that meal saying, they'll never get me. I'm not going to go. I just want the steak. Well, most of them came back ready to go fight somebody. Why? Because they had convinced them to come over to their way of thinking. Well, that's what Paul's talking about here. Paul says, I've borne you again to a new way of thinking. I've brought you over to a new way of life. But how did Paul do that? He didn't do that by feeding them a steak, brethren. He did that by teaching them the gospel. And they obeyed it. And when they obeyed the gospel, what did it work out for them? It worked out the saving of their soul. That's what the Word of God will do. It's a law. It's a perfect law. A perfect law of liberty. When we allow it to be implanted into our hearts with meekness, suppressing those things that will separate us from God, the Word of God will lead us to the salvation of our soul. Well, that's what James has to say, just in passing, if you will, about the Word of God. But remember, his main discussion is about these two people in regard to the Word of God. And the first of those is the forgetful hearer. What did he say about the forgetful hearer? Well, he said in verse 22 of chapter 1 that the forgetful hearer is one who deceives themselves. I don't know about you, but don't you hate it when you deceive yourself into doing something you know you shouldn't have done? I mean, sometimes people deceive us, you know, and they convince us to do something. And, you know, after it, after it works itself out and it, you know it wasn't a good idea, like, I can't believe I let them do that. I'll never do that again. But sometimes when I'm the one who's talking myself into doing that, that's even worse. How did I let myself talk myself into doing something like that? There's no worse deception than deceiving yourself. And that's what James says about these people. These people who, who come into assembly, they sit down, and they think that just somehow hearing the Word of God is going to transform their life without them doing anything at all in regard to it. There was the problem with those people in the first century. And you know what, brethren, unfortunately, it's the same problem many times today. That we think by some way of osmosis again that we can just come into an assembly and partly hear a man preach a sermon. If I can stay awake through it. And it's just gonna, I'm just going to be okay. And I can just go out in the world and just do whatever I want to. And I'm going to be all right. Well, if you're that person... Please let, me, please let me get across to you, if you will, that you're deceiving yourself. That's not going to work. Because it wouldn't work for this individual either. Hearing alone will not make you better. It takes some application to this. You know what hearing alone will do? It will increase your responsibility. The writer to the Hebrews mentions that again back in chapter 10. Will you please work your way back to chapter 10 with me? Notice what he says in verse 26. Now, a little bit of context in the background of this. The writer to the Hebrews, he's writing to Jewish Christians who have already obeyed the gospel, but there are people who are being persecuted by these unbelieving Jews trying to draw them back into Judaism. And the persecution that's going around is causing them to think, well, you know what? Maybe it would be better for me to go back there. 
You know, that system was from God too. And if that system was from God, then maybe it'll be okay and I get all this pressure off of me. Does it sound like a good plan, huh? Well, not according to verse 26. Because he says to those people, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Context is speaking of the Jewish Christians who are starting to draw back. He's saying, now that you have heard and learned the truth about Jesus and the saving power of the gospel in his all-sufficient sacrifice, you can't go back to the temple and make any other kind of sacrifice that's going to bring forgiveness of your sin. It won't happen. Now that you've heard that, you have even more now responsibility to be obedient to what you know to be the truth. It's no different with you and I. You want to come into a church building, sit down in a pew, listen to someone preach the gospel in in all sincerity and truth and think just hearing that message is enough to save you without you taking that and applying it to your life and going out in the world and living it? Think again. That's not how this system works. If I've heard what I need to do, then I'm responsible to do it. Everybody's responsible to obey the gospel. But how much more so those who sit and hear it all the time, who know what the truth is. We have even more responsibility. And if I think that just hearing alone is going to do something for me in my life, uh, then uh, my religion's useless. That's what James says about it. This one's religion is useless. Why is it useless? Because he's not using it. Let me give you a passage which I think that is often used out of context. You may disagree with me and you can talk with me about it later. But I have studied the context of this passage and I think it's talking about what you and I are talking about right now. In Galatians chapter 6, it begins with telling brethren to do their best to spiritually restore those other brethren who have fallen into Trump's transgression. That's the beginning of the context. You who are spiritual, restore such a one with a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also fall into the same trap, right? Notice verses 6 through 8 of the same context. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We often use that passage in talking about monetary support for preachers. I don't think that's in the context at all. There's other passages that talk about that. But this context all the way to verse 10 is talking about someone teaching someone else to get their life right with God. Let the person who's being taught to make his life right with God share in the things that the one is teaching him to do. If someone's teaching you, pleading you to make your life right with God, share in that. Remember, it's all about what you sow in this life. If you sow to the flesh, I don't care what you've already heard. It's not going to reap everlasting life. But if you sow to those things of the Spirit, in regard to what you've been taught to do, then that's what's going to bring the saving of your soul. And I think that follows very well the context that we have here. James says back in chapter 1, in verses 23 and 24, That this person is one that like goes in and looks at himself in a mirror and immediately forgets what he looks like. Have you ever done that? What if you were out working on your car one day and you got your hands all greasy? You've been wiping the sweat off of your face with your greasy hands. You just had grease all over your face. And it was Wednesday afternoon and you were going to have to go to Bible class in just a little while. And you went inside after working on your car and you walk in the bathroom and look at yourself in the mirror and you've got grease all over your face and you're nasty. And you go, huh, my face is nasty. And you just walk away and come to Bible class. How many of you would do that? No, not a single one. 
That's what James is talking about. He's like, when you look into the Word of God and you see the Word of God saying that this is who you are before God. You've got some things that you need to clean up and work out. And you look at that and you see that and you go, huh, I need to clean myself up. You just walk away from it like you never even saw it. He says, don't do that. Don't forget what you've heard. That's contrary to the Lord's will. Jesus spoke to that in Mark 4 and verse 24. He said, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Do you understand what Jesus is trying to get across to us there? Jesus is speaking of how important it is to hear what's being taught and take it and use it. Remember, there's a responsibility. Oh, it's an important responsibility to hear the Word of God. And those of us who hear it and take it and apply it, you know what? We'll grow and we'll abound in that. Does God promise that if we want wisdom, we'll have it? He does. James says it in the first chapter. If I take the Word of God and I study it and I work at it and I soak myself in it, I'll gain wisdom from it. But that same person who hears it and doesn't use it, don't think you're going to gain one iota from it. It's not going to do anything for you spiritually. Why? Because it doesn't happen again by osmosis. It happens by direct application to our lives. And Jesus said in Luke 6 that such a life of the forgetful hearer, well, it's built on certain destruction. Remember what he said about the man who built his house on the sand? But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Why did it fall? Because the person heard what he needed to do. It'd be like going and telling someone, hey, you know what? You need to build your house on a foundation. You need a sturdy structure to set that house upon. If you don't, it's going to collapse. And you hear that and you say, oh yeah, that'd be a good idea. And then you don't do it. Well, how silly is that? That's just like somebody knowing that God is the God of all life and all things. It's by Him that I exist. And hearing His Word teach me, this is what I need you to do. These are the things that I need you to act out. Here's what I've already made possible for you through my Son. You see those things and you say, oh yeah, I need to do that. But then you don't do it at all. That's about the most foolish thing we could ever do. Because it's a life of certain destruction. The life of the forgetful hearer. But in contrast to that, there's the doer of the word. This one is very different. James talks about this person who hears the word and doesn't just not let it go in one ear and out the other. But in verse 22 of chapter 1, he says, be doers of the word. And again in verse 25, that the one who continues in it, that is the perfect law of liberty, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Why? Because our obedience to the word of God, it brings about results, doesn't it? You know, you know what? What did I tell you this morning? I'm standing here right now because of what it's done for me. I am a changed person because of my obedience to the gospel. For the better. For so much better. And I'm not just saying that to try to exalt myself and puff myself up. I have no reason. I do, I've done nothing to exalt myself before you. Glory to God. God is the only reason that I'm a changed person today. And it's because that I come to understand that I cannot fix my sin problem. The only thing that can fix it is Jesus. The only way I know about Jesus and His saving plan is through the Word of God. And I have to study it and learn it. And when I apply that to my life, I'm going to tell you, results just come. The change takes place. Have you ever known someone who used to be just a worldly person? The sinner of all sinners? 
And then all of a sudden, that person is taught the gospel. They obey it. They keep studying it and living it out. And you look at that person now and you say, man, what happened to him? He obeyed the gospel. The gospel is alive in him. That happens. It happened to me. Did it happen to you? That's what happened. What are some of these results? Well, verse 19 says that we're quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Remember, this is in a context of the Word of God. We often use this passage very generally, but James is using this very specifically. When it comes to the Word of God, you be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. When God's speaking, keep your mouth shut and your ears open. And don't let the teaching of God make you mad at Him. Let the teaching of God break your heart. Cause you to submit yourself to Him. And let His Word transform you from the inside out. This person is going to put aside all filthiness and wickedness. He's going to let that good stuff come in. He's going to bridle his tongue then. You know what James is talking about in verse 26? If one can't bridle their tongue, then their religion is going to be useless. You know why he says that? You know what we often do? We read a passage that we don't like. And after we read that passage, we convince ourselves that it doesn't apply to us. We talk to ourselves so much that we talk the passage right out of our mind. We convince ourselves that my wisdom is better than what God's wisdom is. And a lot of times, when someone's speaking to me about what I should do, I'm so busy listening to what I'm saying to myself in my own mind that I don't hear anything anyone else says. Sometimes I just need to shut my mouth and listen to truth. I've got a bride on my own tongue, and a doer of the Word can do that. This one individually, in this individual context that we're talking about, he's going to be one who's about doing the things that God wants him to do. If there's orphans among the group, I'm sure this one would be busy about going and helping them. If there's widows that need needs met among the group, I'm sure this one would be busy about doing that. Why? Because the Word of God taught him to do so, and this one's a doer of the Word. The Word of God controls his life. And he keeps himself unspotted from the world. I quoted this passage one time several years ago. And a brother caught me in the foyer. And he said, Jason, I don't know why you said that. He said, we can't keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I said, the Holy Spirit said we could. Why can't you? Maybe it's because you don't want to. Again, I'm not saying that I'm perfect or you are. I'm not saying that I'm never going to make a mistake and you're never going to make a mistake. However, Peter taught us this morning that if we keep our feet on the path of righteousness, if we keep growing our faith and causing it to abound, adding to it like we should, then we'll never utterly fail in our walk with the Lord. Isn't that right? So therefore, I can keep myself unspotted from the world. Why? Because I keep myself in a position that I'm practicing righteousness, and if I'm practicing righteousness, Jesus is my mediator at the right hand of God. <laughs> That's special, isn't it? That's what we're talking about. And those are the things that a doer of the word has. And the result at the end of it all is a transformed life. <laughs> you've gone from a person who was once among the sinners to now you're a person who's among the state of the saved. What brought about that transformation? The word of God did that. There's never been one person in all of the world in all of time that has ever been changed from the inside out, gone from a sinner to a Christian without the Word of God. The Word of God is the only thing that can do it. And the Word of God is what brings about that transformation. And you know what that does? That really brings us back to where we began today. Remember Romans 12 this morning? We talked about that we are a holy people. We're a people set apart to God. We're a people who are offering up these sacrifices to God day by day by day. We're sacrificing ourselves to do what God desires of us to do. 
And those sacrifices or that life that we're living is pleasing to God. Therefore, I can be holy before God and I can be acceptable in His sight. How is that? Well, it's through my obedience to the Word of God. Doesn't that bring us back here? We've just made full circle once again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's where we began. You see, if I understand who I am before God, if I understand the mercies of God, that God paid a price for my sins before I was even worthy of having a price paid for me. As a matter of fact, I'm never worthy. And while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Think about the mercies of God and what God has done for me. Why would I not present myself every day as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him? I have no reason not to. And when I do that, I can know that I'm set apart to Him. I'm holy. I'm looked upon God as pleasing. And I'm going to renew my mind every day. How am I going to renew my mind? By being a doer of the Word. I'm going to open my Bible every day and I'm going to study it because of what God's already made possible for me. I'm going to allow that teaching to saturate in me knowing it's the perfect law of liberty. And what that's going to do is it's going to transform me. I'm not going to conform back into what the old man was. No, I'm going to keep transforming into that new man, that new creature who has a new life. And how did it come? It came through the Word of God. It came through the Gospel. That's what diligent discipleship is all about. I can't be a diligent disciple if I'm not a doer of the Word. But if I have the right attitude and I have the right outlook, then the outcome is going to be just what it needs to be. I will be a doer of the Word. If you're here this afternoon and you're not a Christian, we plead with you to obey the gospel. Now, it may be that you need to be taught some more things about that. There are men here that would be more than happy to do that, I'm sure. I'd be happy to help you in any way. But you may be more comfortable with somebody else doing that, and that's fine too. But no matter what, we need you first and foremost to learn those things that are going to bring you to the salvation of your soul. And we stand ready to help you. If you're ready to obey the gospel, I know there's water back there. If you're ready to repent of your sins, we'll baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins and you can be a new creature on your way to heaven. Diligent discipleship begins right then. But you may be here and you may not be the Christian that you need to be right now. Hey, I I get it. But the main thing is, is that you realize that and the need to fix it. You have everything that you need to fix it. You have the Word of God. You have brethren around you that love you. You have Jesus at God's right hand ready to extend forgiveness. And the angels will rejoice. Can we help you this afternoon? If so, won't you please come while we stand and we sing. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel and in fact, While you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.